Alex Kaptorovich back. You may remember, at least remember him very fondly for the year he has passed here. It's very nice to have him back. And he's going to speak on the geometry and arithmetic of sphere packing. Okay, well, thanks very much, Mark, and uh, thanks very much for uh, inviting me back here. Um, it's always a pleasure to be back. I think I mentioned to some of you, or some of you know, that uh, my wife was here for uh, seven years or something, so she was doing her MD PhD here. So it's always uh, feels like a homecoming. Um, I thought I would talk about a topic that I can't get away from as much as I try. So uh, I'll, I'll first review some things that I think I even spoke about here, maybe five years ago, when I was here last. Um, so I'll bore you for a few minutes, I hope that's okay. And then I'll try to get to some, uh, some new things. So let's go from the very beginning. So these are Apollonian circle packings. That's uh, what Wikipedia tells me Apollonius looked like. Obviously nobody knows. So um, the general problem that he wanted to solve was given three things, three circles, so three circles, which can have radius infinity or zero uh, to construct uh, circles as many as possible that are tangent to the, the three. So there's one here, I guess there's another one there. And obviously they're supposed to be circles, so you can see how hard this couple is <laughs> even bare hand. He's trying to do it straight into the compass. In the particular case when the three circles are already mutually tangent, the Apollonian problem is, has two solutions and, and here they are. Um, actually, we know that he solved this, but we don't know how, so the, the proof was lost. And it was only uh, yet in uh, 1600, around 1600s that uh, gave a solution which used only tools uh, available to Apollonius. So he, he probably did. Somehow it took another 100 years to realize uh, that all you're doing is, when, when, when you solve this problem in this context, is inscribing circles in these curvilinear triangles. And then you can iterate. So Leibniz was the first one to iterate this, and he iterated ad infinitum. And now it's called Apollonian. I think this name dates to the 1950s. I don't know why they didn't call it a Leibniz packing, but too late now. So it's, so it's an Apollonian circle packing. OK, so uh, aliens uh, like this so much that they build spaceships based on this um, construction and land them in England somewhere. So, uh, the very first question you might uh, want to ask about this, and this we already asked long ago, and, and other people as well, is what is the typical size of a circle as you start en entering more and more of them? So for example, uh, a way of making this precise is you look at how many circles there are in the packing whose radius, so the radii are shrinking, let's, it, let's count how many circles there are with radius at least 1 over 1,000, 1 over a million, 1 over a billion. Um, and it'll be convenient to look at, in fact, the curvatures instead. So there's a one over the radius of the circle. Uh, and then the counting problem is just how many circles are there with curvature at most, a thousand, a billion, and so on. Um, OK, so the first thing you might do is graph that. And you'll see quickly that it's faster than linear, but slower than quadratic. And in fact, the uh, so this is going to work with Yo. This was done before I <laughs> arrived here last time, so I think I spoke about it here. Uh, this is some uh, polynomial with um, a fractal dimension where that dimension is the, the, the Hausdorff dimension of, of that uh, packing. Um, let me very briefly give you a sketch because it'll uh, be relevant to what we do later. So if you start with three circles, just as Apollonius did, C1, C2, and C3, then the two solutions to the Apollonian problem, C4 and C4 prime, are here. And they're dual to one another in the sense that if you take the dual circle, the circle C4 twiddle, which um, goes through the three points of tangency of C1, C2, and C3, then the two are, in, are reflected. So if you take inversion through that circle, it'll preserve C1, C2, C3, and it'll take C4 to C4 prime and vice versa. And if you take all four of those <coughs> inversions, uh, they, these are Viet-like moves that generate the entire packing. So if you take this group generated by inversions in these four circles, you should treat it now not just as happening in the, in the plane, as the plane is the boundary of hyperbolic three space. So take the Poincaré extension and have them act on uh, not as circle reflections, but as hemisphere reflections. So that point will get reflected into there, into there, and so on. And the limit set of this group is exactly this, the closure of the packet. Okay. 
And once you have identified, so now that we have some automorphic structure to, to try to study, to get our hands on these circles, they're not just uh, given by some straight edge compass construction. Uh, the key to understanding how many circles there are with a given curvature, you see, if you have a circle, you can think of not the circle on the ground, but again, take the extension, look at the geodesic hemisphere, and if the circle has radius 1 over 1,000, then the top point of that hemisphere is 1 over 1,000 above the ground. And so what you really want to do is take, a, take various slices at, at height 1 over 1,000, 1 over a million, and so on, and see how those slices distribute in space. And that's, that'll, uh, that's this uh, equidistribution of low-lying porous spheres problem. So let me remind you what it looks like in the classical setting of the modular surface. So again, the modular surface has a cusp at infinity, which means you have a closed horror cycle centered at that cusp. And if you flow by the positive geodesic flow, you just disappear into the cusp and nothing happens. But if you flow by the negative geodesic flow, so this vertical line, this horizontal line is going to get pushed down. And when it gets pushed here, it has to get inverted back into the fundamental domain. And you get these funny curves. And as you push lower and lower, the curve is becoming a space-filling curve with hyperbolic measure. Okay? So if we let HY be this horror cycle at height Y, and Y is going to zero, then uh, the hyperbolic length, the Euclidean length, of course, is one all the way down, but we're measuring hyperbolic length, so it's one over Y that's going to infinity, so these curves are getting longer and longer. And uh, one way to measure this is you take some compactly supported test function, and you want to know what proportion of time did these curves spend in a, in a given region relative to the total volume. And so this is an old theorem. Actually, in this case, it's uh, Zagye and Sarnak generalized it to um, arbitrary Fuchsian groups uh, of the first time. <coughs> so you measure how much time the horror cycle spends in a given region relative to, this should be a length, relative to the length of the horror cycle. And as y gets, uh, y goes to zero as the horror cycle becomes more and more low lying, um, this will approach the proportion of time, the proportion of area uh, that you're measuring relative to the, the total volume. Okay, so um, what you need to prove this theorem is to prove an analog of this in, the, in, in our setting of, um, again, I'll, I'll draw up the space. So we have these four geodesic hemispheres, which are the dual reflections and a fundamental domain for, for the action of this group is just the exterior of these four reflections. So it's an infinite volume space. And so when we divide by volume here in our example, we'll be dividing by infinity. So it's something going to zero. OK, well, that's actually, uh, it's even worse than that. Because each of the horror cycles, the horror cycles are centered at infinity, and there's no stabilizer of infinity. And so the horror cycle themselves have infinite area before you start flowing them down. And so when you divide by the length, now you're saying zero goes to zero. Well, that's a true statement, but uh, a pretty useless one. Um, so you have to make sense of this, and I probably spent the rest of the hour last time I was here making sense of that. Let me not do that and just say there's some analog of this, uh, these ideas um, that let you prove this thing. Okay, so any questions on, on that? So in terms of the, the kind of the classical problem, people didn't realize that actually there, there, there was only one, right? They're just up to Murphy's transformations are always the same? That's right. So it's conformally rigid. Yeah. Uh, and so there is a well-defined number there. That there's a, that's right. So this number, the, the Hausdorff dimension, is, is God-given or Greek-given. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is an absolute constant. Of course, what, what the constant depends on, if you just rescale the packing, of course, you'll have fewer mm -hmm. uh, more or fewer uh, curvatures uh, relative to the bound. But the asymptotic growth rate, the exponential growth rate, is universal. It's conformally. Yeah. Is Great. Is it computable? Is it computable? So it depends on if you're asking mathematicians or physicists. Uh, uh, I think mathematically, which means provably, Kurt McMullen has the world record on this at six decimal places, and physicists have written it out to 30 or something more complicated. Oh, no, I meant the constant in front. I mean, is it oh, okay. this constant in front. Of the um, is it computable? Yes, it's computable as it can be expressed as uh, the Hausdorff measure of a delta dimensional Hausdorff. Uh, yeah, it, it's, well, it's computable, but I, I'm not sure how you would get it at it numerically. It's com theoretically computable, and then numerically it's, it's a little delicate. 
Uh, I thought you were talking about this constant, which itself is a very interesting constant to compute. I mean, the way you really prove this is by going to Patterson-Sullivan theory and understanding the base eigenvalue on this space. And uh, that's one way of getting at this Hausdorff dimension is by analyzing the Laplacian, the, 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 the spectrum. Is uh, it an algebraic number? Or? This one? Yeah. Presumably transcendental, but I don't think anybody has any clue how to prove it's irrational. Even. Any idea? Uh, yeah, no, I know nothing about it other than the six decimal places that we call it. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, Leibniz has, had observed this uh, iteration. Somehow everybody, including Descartes and Newton and uh, all kinds of very smart people who study this picture, missed something very beautiful that Saudi observed. And it goes exactly back to uh, Claude's question about uh, these circle packings being rigid over C, but they are, there are many over Q, as I'll, as I'll explain in a second. So what he observed is, he actually wanted to compute these bands for a physical uh, computation, a physical machine that he was building. He had to compute these curvatures, and, and so he started computing them, and one, one sample uh, con uh, configuration is this one. So um, the, I'm plotting the curvature. So this is something with radius 118, the circle radius 118, which is kissing a circle of radius 1 over 23. The outermost has radius a tenth, but we want the orient, we're going to keep track of orientation. So we want the interiors to all be disjoint. So I'll give the outermost the opposite orientation. So I'll give it a minus sign in the curvature. Keep track of that. And when you put in the next two, when you, when you constructed the next two circles, he found they had curvatures 27 and 35, and the next had curvatures 63 and 47, and so on. What he, he, he was trying to figure out why is he getting integers all the way down. So these are the integral Apollonian circle packings that Saudi observed, and miraculously no one before him that we know of did. Uh, so why did he... So he's a radio chemist. He won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for discovering isotopes, believe it or not. Sorry, what? The isotopes. He isotope. coined the term isotope. Oh. Huh. Yeah. So, um, so wh where is this coming from? So what Saadi rediscovered is a theorem of Descartes uh, from 300 years before, which is the following. If you have four circles, C1 through C4, that are mutually tangent, and their curvatures are kappa 1 through kappa 4, then they satisfy this algebraic relation that Descartes had already worked out long ago, but didn't see where, uh, where it takes you. So let's see where it takes you. Uh, so for example, oh yeah, and he gave, uh, so he published this result in an unusual journal for mathematics, and he stated the result in an unusual way in uh, poetry. So four circles to the kissing cup, that's four tangent circles, the smaller the bender, the bend is just the inverse of the distance from the center, one over the radius is what he calls bend. Though their intrigue left Euclid dumb, there's not a need for a rule of thumb. Since zero bends a dead straight line, so curvature zero is infinite radius, that's a straight line. And concave bends are minus sign, that's our orientation. Uh, the sum of the squares of all four bends is half the square of their sum. So anyway, so he, he's, a, he's a sharp guy. Okay. So, um, this is after we got the Nobel Prize. This is after. <laughs> <laughs> About a decade after. He can do it. Then. He can, yeah. <laughs> So he, you mean he can publish whatever he wants in nature? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so what's the corollary of this? So here's the Descartes theorem again. So look, if I give you kappa 1, kappa 2, kappa 3, if I give you 18, 23, and 10, negative 10, then you have a quadratic form in kappa 4. Quadratic forms have two solutions. Those two solutions are exactly, that's an algebraic proof of Apollonius' theorem that there's two circles uh, that can be constructed given the three initial ones. So the, the two solutions would be 27 and 35. And you, everybody knows the quadratic formula, there's that square root term. So that's exactly what's going on there. So if you add the two solutions, if you take kappa 4 and kappa 4 prime, these two curvatures, and you add them, you'll get something rational in the original ones. And it turns out you get something integral in the original ones. So uh, you just get twice the sum of the original curvatures. And what this means is, so these are the Viet involutions that we saw before that fix C1, C2, and C3, and replace C4 by C4 prime, but now algebraically instead of geometrically. 
And so this kappa 4 prime is an integer linear combination of the previous curvatures, but you obtain every circle in the packing from the previous, from, from the initial four by these Viet moves. And so uh, they're the, uh, the Viet moves. So what Saudi observed exactly from this is that if you have four mutually tangent circles, all of whose curvatures are already integral, then they're integers all the way down. So that's the, so that's the proof of this integral. Okay. Any questions on that? So this is kind of a beautiful, you know, this miraculous quadratic equation just happens to come out with this uh, integral. So who discovered that equation again? Descartes. Descartes. Yeah. So Descartes, I think, is going back through just all of the geometry before, except now he's putting coordinates in it since he discovered the Cartesian plane. And uh, starts noticing all kinds of algebraic relations that people had before, including this. Yes. Do we have any general formula for all for how all the other curvatures are supposed to relate? No. A general formula. So you, what you'll get is this thin group that's acting on four tuples of curvatures. In other words, so if I have kappa one, kappa two, kappa three, kappa four, and I want to turn that into leaving the first three alone and replacing kappa 4 by kappa 4 prime, which is exactly what that Viet evolution is doing. I can do it by leaving kappa 1, kappa 2, and kappa 3 alone. And in place of kappa 4, there is the formula right there. I want two kappa 1s, two kappa 2s, two kappa 3s, and a minus kappa 4 will get me kappa 4 prime. So you have, there's nothing special about the fourth entry. You have three more uh, matrices. And the group generated, so this, if we call this C4 twiddle, which is the dual to C4. So the group gamma, which is generated by, by these four reflections, is some thin group with Hausdorff, with the limit set having Hausdorff, the you know, growth rate is this uh, 1.3 dimension. And that's what acts on these curvatures. Now, I think the question you're asking is the one on the next page. What are these numbers? For some reason, it took another 100 years before someone asked that question. From Saudi seeing these integers to someone saying, wait, which, which integers actually arise? So this was uh, initiated in a series of papers, beautiful papers, by Graham, Ligarius, Malos, Wiltz, and Yan, starting in 2003, I think, five papers or so on, on all kinds of uh, related topics. And the very first question you should ask if you're a number theorist and someone hands you a bunch of integers is, which ones are they? So let's set k to be the set of curvatures. So in this case, in this example, the curvatures are negative 10, 18, 23, 35, 47, and, and so on. Okay, so it's just a list of numbers. If you go online, find, find out. What's that? If you go online. Um, I think you'll find this sequence in the uh, online encyclopedia of right. integer sequences, yeah. Um, and uh, so, okay, if you're a number theorist, maybe you would think to notice things like this, but here's an observation that they did make and uh, was explained in Elena Fuchs's thesis, is that if you look at these numbers mod 24, you will only see the residue classes 2, 3, 6, and so on up to 23. So, uh, what's 63 mod 24? One third. Yeah. What's that? One third of the residue classes. Yeah, only a third of the residue classes arise mod 24. Okay. So they observed it empirically, and Fuchs uh, sort of proved uh, exactly where it comes from. In a word, where it comes from is that this group, so this group sits inside the integer group, which preserve, the orthogonal group preserving that quadratic form, the Des Descartes quadratic form, with integer entries. Of course, this is a lattice, uh, and this is a thin group. Um, but it's nevertheless risky dense in that group. And so the Drisky density, okay, you have to pass to the simply the spin cover, um, double cover, so you get um, semi-simple groups, and uh, then strong approximation tells you that outside of the reduction of this this thin group mod p is the full orthogonal group mod p for all primes away from bad primes. So that's where this number 24 is coming from. The only bad primes are two and three. And two stabilizes after the third power. And three What's stabilizes. the statement you get from the density? What's the statement? From the Zariski density, so the Zariski density plus semi-simple. Um, so I need to take I need to take the spin double. I need to take yeah. some. There's some index two condition. Uh, gives you strong approximation. So strong approximation. 
uh, tells you in the sense that if you take this group gamma, which is just, you know, with, if you ask me, if you give me a matrix, four by four integer matrix, I can determine whether or not it's in this group just by checking if it stabilizes this form. I cannot, well, so in this case I can, but in general, I cannot determine whether it's in, right, the word problem in a group is undecidable in complete general. In this case, there's a reduction of it. Um, but I can determine, so if I look at gamma mod some prime p, for what strong approximation tells us is outside of some primes and also prime powers, this will be the full orthogonal group with entries in z mod p. Okay, so there's a, mod, there's a modular stability, which is, in the Archimedean sense, it's very thin, but look, if you localize everything, it stabilizes. So that's where this number 24 is, and that's the analysis that uh, Elena Fuchs. Oh, Freddy's risky dance group is outside of that prime. Yeah. That's the statement. That's the statement of strong approximation. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, again, we're trying to figure out which integers am I going to see here. And I should not look for integers that aren't in one of these residue classes. So I'll call those numbers admissible. So an, an integer is admissible if it lies in some residue. Uh, now, 6 is admissible, but a circle of radius 1, 6 is going to be bigger than, it's just not there. So another obstruction to uh, an, uh, an integer arising is that it's too small. And the most natural conjecture, and this is the local global conjecture for integer circle packings, already uh, stated in some form here and uh, explained a little bit uh, more detail in this paper of Fuchs and Sandin, is that if you're, admiss if you're an integer and you're admissible, you pass these local obstructions and you're sufficiently large, then you do arise as the curvature of some circle. So uh, 24,023 will be a number that's admissible. So there's some circle way deep in there that has that number as its curvature. Right? That's, that's the, the local global objection. Kind of the, the only obstructions are the ones we know. And empirically, how big is Empirically, how big is it to you start getting them all? Uh, good question. So that's one of the things that was worked out and that, that was experimented on in this paper. This is a paper in experimental map uh, of Fuchs and Sandin. And so, it depends on the packing. So if each packing has its own sufficiently large. Okay. I think for this particular packing, it's something like 20,000. Oh. It's reasonable, but there's still a lot of gaps quite a, quite a ways up. And in general, Presumably, it can be as, as large as you want. Again, because there are many over Q, they're, they're just different configurations. What did you want to ask? Yeah, so you, but the statement is that for each packing, there's for each pack is sufficiently large. Yes. Depends on the particular packing. Yes. Other than that, the only obstruction are the rest of the Yes. And this number 24 is universal, does not depend on the particular packing, but the residues that arise do depend on the packing. The universality of 24 comes from the universality of the group. And the failure or not failure of strong approximation of the group. So once once you once you have the full orthogonal group, it acts transitively. So you'll get to all this. Group. Can you say what twenty four has to do with that matrix? Yes. If you take the reduction mod two or mod three of the group generated by those matrices, you will not get the full orthogonal group. Outside of the primes two and three, you do get everything. For the primes two and three, if you go to two to the fourth or higher. What you'll get is the pre-image of everything you had at 2 to the 3. So 8 is a local obstruction, and there's a similar statement for 3. So 3 times 8 is 24. That's where 24 is. So that's universal. Which residue classes depends on the packing? How large is sufficiently large depends on the packing. But if you know. So the cloth pointed out it was rigid over C, right? Yes. You know that. And now you're saying over Q, there are a lot of different yes. classes. That was, that's what we're talking about. Yes. So if you, I don't quite understand. What, how do we get the Q structure? Well, the Q structure is just <coughs> so over C is the same as saying O Q R acts transitively on the variety Q equals zero, where Q is that form. The sum of the squares minus half the square of the sum. Now, if you look at this variety as an integer variety, this. Maybe it doesn't act exactly transitively, but there's a finite, this is a lattice, so it, it will have a finite number of orbits. But this group has infinitely many orbits on this variety. It decomposes this variety over z into infinitely many orbits. That's, that's exactly the infinite index condition. 
So there are infinitely many uh, integer Apollonian circle packings, even though there's only one complex Apollonian circle okay. packing. So, so three points on, on P1 are equivalent over SL2R, so right? So you can put SL2Q. Oh, yeah, exactly. Oh. So how many points do we start with here? Three. So you start with three points. On if you like, you can start with the three. You can treat the boundary as as, as fixed, and then where the location of those three points of, of tangent. Oh, I see. So those three points and over determine C, every three points. There's no nothing. And over Q, there's something there. Yep. Exactly. Okay. So this is a conjecture. It's still wide open. Um, but uh, so John Bergen and I uh, returned to this a few years ago, and we proved that it's true in density. What? In the sense of density, the conjecture is true. So 100% of the conjecture is true. Oh, density. 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 So what this means is you look at how many curvatures you'll see up to x, where x is a growing parameter, relative to how many admissibles. And as Dennis just pointed out, this is asymptotic x over 3, a third of the, there are eight residue classes out of the possible 24. So, you, so the number of curvatures you'll find up to x relative to how many you should find up to x, that ratio goes to 1. So that's 100% of the curve of the local uh, to global conjecture is true, but that's very far from saying that the conjecture itself is true. So for this particular, so you, in here you have eight residue classes for this particular pattern. Yes. We, you would always have eight? No, eight sometimes you'll eight. have, yeah, there, there's a variety of types of residue classes, which just has to do with um, the, the, the Q structure, yeah, the orbit of this group, how it decomposes on, the, in this, on, on this variety over Z mod 24Z. So it decomposes in some number of orbits, and whichever, what, whatever numbers arise in those orbits determine how many possible admissible numbers are. But the theorem is, is robust, it doesn't care how many there are, the, the ratio will always go. However many there's supposed to be, you get 100% of them. You don't get every single one. And we have a rate and so on. But what's the one sentence idea for that? Uh, next slide. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you in a second. So uh, I should say this builds on work already in this five author paper. Uh, there's a very key insight in a letter of Sarnax to Jeff Legarius, and then um, work by Fuchs and Bergen. Fuchs showed that this uh, is bounded away from zero. So there's a positive proportion of the numbers that was known uh, in this work of Regan Fuchs, and now we, we know 100% of the numbers that should be there are. OK, as uh, Dennis asked, here's a sketch. Um, so the very first thing you might ask is, why should the conjecture be true? I mean, we just said, OK, there are these obvious local obstructions, mod, you know, uh, mod finite primes. There's some obstructions mod the prime infinity has to be sufficiently large. But beyond that, why should it be true? Well, if you remember, we count, we know how many curvatures there are with multiplicity, in other words, circles. And the number of circles is x to the 1.3. But the number of integers up to x is just x. And so what's the typical, if you have an admissible number of size x, how many times do you expect it to arise? How many circles should there be with that integer um, as its curvature? So what's the multiplicity? Well, the total number is x to the 1.3. But there's only x possible integers that they could be spread upon. And so you expect the multiplicity to be x to the 0.3. And the nice thing about a positive exponent is this goes to infinity. And a quantity that goes to infinity eventually gets bigger than 0. And if you're bigger than 0, you're at least 1 because you're a number. And uh, that means there is some circle having that curvature. So that's where these s. So that's where um, the, you know, your question of how large is sufficiently large, whenever this heuristic kicks in. Um, that's when the number should be represented. Now, we can't prove this. But what we can prove is using the circle method and analytic number theory techniques, we can show that the multiplicity, not individually, but on average, is as large as it's supposed to be, this x to the 0.3. And even that's a slight lie. It's much more technical than that. So it uses expander graphs, um, creating bilinear forms, and vector distribution and cosets. Um, and there's a survey of this in uh, the bulletin from, from A to Z. Uh, you can read some, some things. Okay, so um, so that was all old news. That was all introduction. Am I out of time? What time did I start? Oh, oh I, it's not at four thirty. Yeah, <laughs> good. Okay, so so here's what I have, have been, I, and I try to get away from this problem. I, you know, I, well, the reason is we haven't learned how to draw a good circle. <laughs> 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 
You're absolutely right. <laughs> Easy psychology. Your Maybe they'll teach me. You, if you'll teach me the right way to do it. Yeah. I keep coming back because I really, yeah, really love the trust. Yeah. You should marry him after 10 years. <laughs> then I'll love that's a, that's a, I'll take that. So, um, so a few years. Uh, so I, I've been thinking about these things, and I, I keep going away and doing other things. But what really bothered me is why does any of this exist? So I can prove Descartes' statement, and, but why philosophically? Why should I? Right, that's pretty good study right there, right now. Yeah, but what's that? What's that? Yeah. What does it really mean? What, where are these Viet moves come from? Why is there this beautiful Kleinian group which has this limit set? Um, so, in other words, what's the general setting for this problem? Maybe, that, maybe that'll help me understand some of those problems. Um, you know, you, if you generalize something, you might understand it from another point of view. And, um, so here's the general setting after uh, a few years of uh, tweaking. So what do I mean by a packing? So a packing of Rn is a collection of oriented n minus one spheres uh, or uh, planes whose, dis whose interiors are disjoint. So I want to have this. Uh, non-overlapping, and I want the tangency graph to be connected. So I want packing, so that the, the spheres are all, you know, touching or or separated, and the uh, and there's a cohesion in, in the orientation. Okay, so that's a packing. The packing is dense if it fills up all of space. So any ball will intersect the interior of some sphere in the packing. Okay, and the packing is integral if every sphere has Radius one over n integer. So these I should call bends now because curvature is proportional, depending on which curvature you mean, proportional one over radius squared in general. Okay, so if you want to classify infinite dense integral packings, that's a that's a, a fool's errand because you just start with any sphere and then you start adding integers, spheres having integer curvatures until you filled up all the space and you have no structure. So um, the Real definition is the following. So I'm going to say a gamma packing is an infinite dense packing, P, for which there exists a discrete subgroup, G, discrete geometrically finite subgroup of isometries acting on hyperbolic n plus 1 space, which is generated by reflections, just, just like in the Apollonian case, uh, whose limit set is the packing. Well, the packing had extra data. It had orientation. And limit set is just a set. So I have to forget the orientation, and I need to take its closure. But it, those are the, the obvious ones. So that's what I will call a gamma packing. So a gamma packing is a packing which is dense and infinite. And I want there to be a group which is the symmetry group this way. And now the problem is let's try to classify all integral gamma packings, ones whose, whose uh, bends are all integers. OK, um, at first the problem looks pretty hopeless. We made this you know, very kind of general definition. Actually, it might be doable. So here's, um, here's a definition that we'll need. So when you have one of these groups, one of these thin groups, you can fill it out in a very natural way to a lattice. And here's how. To a gamma packing, we'll attach a supergroup, which we'll call gamma tilde, which is a group generated by the gamma and reflections through the spheres themselves. So in the case of the Apollonian group, the group is generated by these four reflections through these four dual circles. But the supergroup is take reflections through the dual circles and the circles themselves. So then you get a lattice. In this case, it's an ideal octahedron with all dihedral angles pi over 2. So that's commensurate with SL2 of the Gaussian. So here's a, a fundamental domain for that, that action. So it's an ideal octahedron. Can you go back to the definition of the previous one? Yes. Infinite definite such that there exists generated reflections with limit set what? What is that? So this is just the packing. The limit set is the packing, except the packing has orientation, the limit set doesn't. So forget no, about no, the orientation. No, what is the limit set of a packing? Oh no no, the limit set of a group. Oh, but well, yeah, limit set oh the limit set of gamma equals the limit set of gamma being Oh is okay. Yeah. I got that. I just want to restrict this. No, I got it. I got yeah. it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um what I'm trying to well, say... The packings have to be limit sets. Pack, yeah, I want the packings that are limit sets. Okay. That's exactly what I want. Not just arbitrary packings. Of the packings, which are limit sets of finite groups. The finally generated groups? I want finally generated finally by reflection. Finally groups. Yeah. Well, geometrically finite, I want even more. 
fear is kind of like death. So uh, well, this is pretty strong. It's pretty strong, but it's what yeah, I have tools to. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So this is the uh, so this is the fundamental domain of, of what you get in the Apollonian set. Okay. So that's a that's the supergroup. So this is how you take the symmetry group that, that is fractal dimension and fill it out to a, a full lattice. Then you can form the super packing. So the super packing attached to a packing is let the super group act on the packing itself. In other words, start with the initial circle. Well, here's a picture of it. So you start with the initial uh, packing, but then you also invert inside all the circles themselves, not just through the dual circles. So it's, it's the orbit in the boundary. I mean, this thing is going to be dense. I'm only showing you uh, some bits of it. But it's the uh, spheres that you get by taking the, the, all the spheres in the packing and acting not just by the group but also by inversion through the spheres. Is that is that clear? So this is the picture you should have in mind. Now, now you're filling out space instead of having a packing. Okay, and I'll define a gamma packing to be super integral if not only is every bend in the packing itself integral but every bend in the super packing is also integral. And so, now let's see if we can, on, on the way to classifying integral gamma packings, let's try to classify super integral gamma packings. That's a slightly uh, stronger condition. So here's our super pack. <laughs> this is uh, joint work with uh, my postdoc, uh, Kei Nakamura at Rutgers. So this is the super integral packing arithmeticity conjecture. Good thing we got this uh, out before another break. Um, <laughs> so if a gamma packing is super integral, Right? If every single uh, curvature, if every single bend, not only in the packing itself, but also in the super packing, is an integer, then the super group, which is a lattice, is, it's already a hyperbolic reflection group, it's arithmetic. In the sense of arithmetic groups? In the sense of arithmetic groups. So the integrality of this packing should force the group to come from arithmeticity. And you remember the previous example, we had SL2 of the Gaussian integer. Nice arithmetic group. So if so, uh, let me first remark: super integrality is necessary. So we have examples of integral gamma packing, which are not super integral, for which the supergroup is not arithmetic. It's just barely not arithmetic. It's one of these uh, Deligne Mostow examples oh. of uh, s arithmetic. It sits inside an s arithmetic group, so it should be a lattice in the product of two factors. But it's already lattice in the real factor. Which means it's thin in the as an S arithmetic group, so it's non arithmetic. Um, so super integrality is a necessary condition. The conjecture is a su sufficient condition as well. So if the super pack conjecture, if we could prove this, and there's some hope that we actually can, it would be very useful because of work going back to Vinberg and Nikulin and Long, Black, and Reed, Egel, Egel, Milopetsky, Storm, and White, that says there are only finitely many arithmetic hyperbolic reflection groups, maximum. So that means that this Apollonian packing really is only one of a finite list of things where this can happen. And How by big the, is it in this dimension? And there's none above a certain dimension, right? Oh, right. None once okay. the dimension's above 30. All right. You're, you're, you're right on it. No, but Vinberg, I know. Yeah. That was, so the guy who's persecuted for having a Jewish name, but he's not Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is exactly how this is proved. First, you show that there aren't any above a certain dimension. Then you show that in every dimension, there can only be finitely many. So that's it. It's finitely many total. And this is, a, this is an argument from the base eigen, from the first eigenvalue. This is a special gap argument. So there's an upper bound given the uh, volume and, and other such things. And then the, the arithmeticity gives you a lower bound on lambda 1. That's it. There's only a finitely many that satisfy. Um, I have to go now. Okay. To dinner. Okay. So we can talk. About, I want to tell you a little bit more about this. I'll tell you. So is the uh, is the conjecture clear? Yeah. Are so it's not all Apollonian packings are uh, are uh, super super integral. So certainly not all sphere packings in general. You can have all kinds of bizarre behavior. No, no, but the Apollonian ones, the integral Apollonian sphere. All of the so there's only one. Supergroup. 
So what we're interested in now, given the super, given the pack, the Apollonian packing is super integral, and then it has a super group. And that group, in the case of the Apollonian packing, is SL2 of the Gaussians. So it is arithmetic. So, um, so what this says is the super pack conjecture, again, if we could prove it, would tell us that there are essentially finitely many super integral gamma packings. So that's kind of the, uh, the hope is that we really can have a complete classification of these. Um, so first, let me give you some examples. So these are examples that were known prior to our work. Uh, Saudi already observed the integrality of a sphere packing, uh, which we now call the four simplex, model on the one scale of the four simplex. Uh, my student here at Stony Brook, Xin Zhang, uh, studied for his thesis the octahedral packing, which was observed by Gutler Malas in, in 2010, and proved the analog of our theorem that a density one uh, set of this density one local global theorem. And um, uh, Diaz and Nakamura independently uh, proved a similar theorem for the four order plus. So those were kind of there were a few sporadic examples that were known, and we were trying to. Um, so we're coming to the problem from both directions. One, get as many examples as we can, and two, give an upper bound to how many examples there can possibly be. Uh, question? Yeah. Just to follow up on my earlier question, Please. so uh, would you say there's essentially only finite, if the conjecture is true, there's essentially only finitely many of these groups, but for each group you could have infinitely many packings? There's so there's a maximality. Uh, okay. I'll explain in a second. Yeah. So, um, in dimension, for in sphere packings and in higher dimensions, even constructing gamma packings, never mind its integrality, is already a long study problem, uh, going back to Boyd and Maxwell and uh, lots of people. Um, and there's lots of applications to rational points on K3 surfaces and Lorentz and Katz Moody algebras. This is a very well studied, uh, if you don't insist on integrality, then it's kind of a wild um, uh, area. Uh, moreover, uh, so I observed this a few years ago. If you look at sphere packings and higher, you remember that multiplicity calculation we had. It was Hausdorff dimension minus one was the expected exponent of the multiplicity. But if you go to sphere packings, now the Hausdorff dimension is at least two. And so the multiplicity goes up uh, significantly, and that makes the local global problem actually easier. So you can have, you can prove the full local global problem um, in sphere packings and higher. So really, circle packings. Uh, dimension two, that is circle packings, R2, uh, is the most interesting from the point of view of local global, and it's also the most available from the point of view of uh, worrying about constructions. The reason it's available is thanks to the Kovendre of Thurston theorem. So, uh, as I'll explain in a second, this gives you a huge family of circle packings to mine. So, how do you do that? So, what are the, so these are polyhedral circle packings. You can attach a circle packing to um, any convex polynomial. So here's the theorem, and uh, Schramm kind of gave uh, an actual proof of the version I'm stating here. So every convexly realizable combinatorial polyhedron admits a uh, geometrization that has a mid-sphere. So a mid-sphere means uh, there's a sphere, a geometric sphere, which is tangent to all the edges. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's uh, look at this Archimedean solid, the cube octahedron. So if you start with a cube and you chop off the corners, and you keep chopping them until you get all the way down to the midpoint, you get what's called a cube octahedron. It's the same thing as if you start with an octahedron and chop the midpoints. Chop until you get down to the midpoint. So this is a cube octahedron, which just means so every vertex has next to it a triangle square, triangle square, and it's vertex transient. Okay, so that's the combinatorial data. From that combinatorial data, this theorem gives, this KAT theorem gives a, a geometrization which is, has the same combinatorial data, so there's a triangle, square, triangle, square, except now there's a sphere that you can blow up from the center until it's exactly tangent to every edge. So the sphere is inside the polyhedron at the cones, cone points, and it's outside the polyhedron on the faces, and it just kisses all the edges. Is that clear? So that's this Kobe and of Thurston theorem. So, I claim it allows one to attach a gamma packing to any polyhedron. You take your polyhedron, you geometrize it. Once it's geometrized, this mid-sphere is also the mid-sphere of the dual polyhedron. So in this case, in the case of the cube octahedron, the dual is this, uh, these are rhombi. So it's a rhombic, let's see, um, what are the, how many vertices? The number of faces, the number of vertices of the dual. So I have four on top, four on bottom, and four in the middle. So I have 12 
vertices of a cubohedron, so I have 12 faces of its dual. So this is a rhombic dodecahedron, if you like. So that's this purple dual polyhedron. And what that gives you, if you look at the intersection of the faces with the sphere, you get a circle packing, which is modeled on the vertex structure of the dual polygon, and you get a purple circles, you get purple circles at every vertex of the original polygon. So you get two tangency graphs, which after stereographic projection I can draw in the plane. So the blue, uh, the blue circles are, have the tangency structure of the cube octahedron. If I look at this circle, the next to this circle is a square, then a triangle, then a square, and then a triangle. That's exactly the pattern around, around every vertex in the cube up. And then, and then the dual is orthogonal. So what is the group of reflections? The uh, group is the reflections through the dual cluster. So reflections through these purple circles acting on the blue circles will give us the packing. Um, so that acts on the polyhedral cluster and gives a packing modeled on that polyhedral. So that's how you get a huge family of circle patterns to mine for integrality. And people had been doing this, and uh, somehow they haven't found any. Um, well, there's a way of doing it that uh, maybe is not so uh, amenable to finding integer uh, Okay, so, so we'll define a polyhedron to be integral if there exists an integral packing modeled on that polyhedron. Okay? And the question becomes, what are the integer polyhedron? Or super integral polyhedron? Is this clear? So all you do is you take your polyhedron, you apply covariate first to geometrize it. That gives you it and its dual as clusters on the surface of the sphere, which you stereographically project. Let the dual act on the original cluster, and that gives you a packing which has that structure. Okay, so let's try to classify the integral polyhedron. Well, there's uh, determine even, I said you just geometrize it, but even determining whether a given polyhedron is integral is rather non-trivial because the covariant of Thurston theorem is an existence proof. There's an infinite limiting process which at the end is proved to achieve geometrization. But uh, how are you supposed to recognize whether 4.9999999 actually is 5? Right? Uh, to the rescue is must have rigidity. So because these are all uh, dimension 3 and higher, hyperbolic manifolds, the um, curvatures and the centers all have to be algebraic. So what do you do when you see 4.9999? You guess that it's 5, because it has to based on an algebraic number. So you get enough decimal places, you guess the algebraic value, and then you go back and rigorously verify that yes, those algebraic values do satisfy the tangency conditions I, I was just insisting on. So that's a way of, of truncating the, the infinite process of geometrization. Is that clear? <coughs> so there's some mixture of these things. Even then they're difficult. So for example, so here's a, a theorem. There are infinitely many polyhedra that are integral. This is going to go back uh, to your question. Um, that's an immediate corollary of infinitely many distinct polyhedra give rise to the same exact circle pattern. So there's not a unique way, there's not a unique polyhedron that realizes the Apollonian circle pattern. Uh, and moreover, not only that, but there are indeed infinitely many non-isomorphic integral circle paths. Completely distinct, with distinct house dwarf dimensions. And the proofs of these are various doubling and gluing constructions. You can take a polyhedron, you double along a face, or you double along a vertex and glue. Um, of course, these are non-maximal. So remember the, the finiteness uh, theorem is about er maximal arithmetic hyperbolic reflection groups. So, um, these would all be, these kind of are cheating. They, they don't count, they all, they're all coming from one, one family. And Alcock has uh, examples in higher dimensions, dimensions up to 19 or so of, of these kinds of constructions. Okay, so here's uh, what we can prove. This is what I'd love to be able to say. The following is a complete list of integral convex polyhedra. That's the classification. Yes? Quick question. Yes. You say? So you said, suppose you're given uh, a polyhedra and you want to check whether it's integral or not. Yes. So the monster rigidity that you can, so the centers and uh, bands are algebraic for any polyhedron or? No, because if you shrink it by pi, 
If you yeah. start with an irrational one, you shrink it by five. You 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 so, want to give yourself some nice coordinates when you're so actually. So you can make it so you can scale it so that it's algebraic as well. Right. So what it tells us there exists. Oops. What it tells you is that there always you can make all the bends and for centers. Any, for, any, uh, polyhedron. for any polyhedron, there's a cluster modeled on that polyhedron for which all the bends and uh, centers are algebraic. And then you want to check that that's integral. Right. You have to figure out not only whether the cl cluster is integral, but then when you start inverting through the dual cluster, whether you will always have integrality. So you need some version of De the Descartes theorem in all of these cases. But there might be many, many, ways, many ways to make it algebraic. So how do you know that there's something that, you know, so let's say you could, you could check that it's integral for one. Of course. You can take the Apollonian packing and scale it by root two. Right. And then it, it's algebraic, but it's not integral. Yeah, there is a there is a way um, which I may or may not have time to explain, but I can tell you about. It. Yeah, so it's I hope you agree it's a non-trivial problem to figure out, given the polyhedron, whether or not it's it's integral. There, another question. Okay, uh, so here's the theorem. We do not have a complete list of integral convex polyhedra. We have a complete list of integral convex uniform polyhedra. So these uniform are again uh, the regular the faces are regular polygons and it's vertex transitive. So this is some very small subset, obviously, of all. They come in three flavors: the poly, the platonic solids. So the tetrahedron gives you the classical Apollonian packing. The octahedron is that picture we saw earlier that was studied by uh, Gibler Mellows and Xinjiang here in Stony Brook. Uh, the cube also gives you an integral packing, and it's uh, maybe not so surprising that it's dual to the octahedron, and it arose also in work of Kate Stange very recently. Um, the, dodeca and icosa the dodecahedral and icosahedral packings cannot be made integral, but actually they can be made golden. You can make them uh, in the ring of integers of the golden mean. But they're not arithmetic. The, the corresponding groups are not arithmetic. I mean, there's a root five, so that tells you already uh, you're going to have problems with arithmetic. For the Archimedean solids, again, you get three more. The cube octahedron that we were looking at as an example is, turns out to be, uh, to be integral. The truncated tetrahedron and truncated octahedron are integral. It turns out that the uh, icosadodecahedron and the great and small rhombi icosadodecahedra and the truncated dodeca and icosahedra are all golden as before. I don't know if you know all these, the zoology of uh, Archimedean solids, but anyway. Uh, the truncated cube, the great and small rhombi uh, rhombi cube octahedra are silver. So they have bends, I learned this word on Wikipedia, I don't know if it's actually a word. Uh, <laughs> but instead of having all ones in the continued fraction, if you have all twos in the continued fraction, they call that the silver edition. I've never heard of that. <laughs> anyway, so, so I'm using it. So, uh, so these have all uh, silver bends. And then the two remaining of the Archimedean solids, the snub cube and the snub decahedron, snub cube has cubic bends, not integers. In, the, in this ring, in this cubic ring, and the snub dodecahedron has sextic bends. So that's the kind of the end of the list there. There are two infinite families of uniform polyhedra, the prisms and the antiprisms. Prism is you have a n-gon on top, the same thing on bottom, and you just connect uh, squares all around. The antiprism is you rotate by half the, half the um, angle, and then you put uh, triangles in between. So these are the prisms, the antiprisms. Of these, the only integral ones are the three, four, and six prism, and the three anti-prism. Um, now this is cheating a little bit because what's a four prism? Four prism means I have a square on top and bottom, and then I connect it by squares. That's a cube. Okay, we had that already on the list. So that's not something new. How about a three anti-prism? I have a triangle on top, triangle on bottom. I move them a little and then connect by triangles. Well, that's not the heat. So that's, again, not anything new. The three prism is interesting. Because a three prism is a triangle on top and a triangle on bottom, and then connected by squares. And this is a gluing of a tetrahedron and another tetrahedron. When, when you cut, so you double and you cut away the vertex and glue. And you'll get the uh, triangular prism. So in fact, this doesn't give a new circle packing, it gives the Apollonian packing. The six prism is the most interesting of these. 
The six prism is integral, but it's not super integral. And its corresponding super packing group is not arithmetic. So that's, we initially conjectured the packing, er, the pack, arithmeticity conjecture before we realized we need a super pack for, for things to be true. Uh, moreover, the dual polyhedron is integral or golden or silver if and only if the original polyhedron is. So it gives us this rhombic dodecahedron that we were uh, looking at before is indeed integral, as are the triacus tetrahedron and tetricus hexahedron. These are the uh, Catalan solids dual to the Archimedean solids. Of course, the tetrahedron is self-dual, the cube and octahedron are dual to each other. Uh, the duals of the prisms are bipyramids, and the duals of the antiprisms are trapezohedron. So the six by pyramid um, is just uh, vertex on top and bottom and six around. So that's the hexagonal by pyramid is again integral but not super integral. It's a very uh, bizarre situation. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the classification of uniform. Uh, polyhedron. I hope that's that's clear. So um, just to show you what this looks like in the remaining minute, uh, let me uh, try to illustrate what happens for our cube octahedron. So remember, cube octahedron just means uh, every vertex has triangle square, triangle square around it. So here's a integral cluster modeled on this uh, modeled on that tangency graph. So if you look at this vertex. Next to it is a square, then a triangle, then a square, then a triangle, and that happens all the way around. And the bends are labeled, so they're all integers. And when you fill this out, so one dual reflection, one dual circle is the reflection through this circle, which takes this whole cluster into here, and it reappears, this whole cluster reappears there, and so on, ad infinitum, and they're all integers. So that's the integral uh, cube octahedron. And again, this should be finite in many. Um, and uh, a theorem with a little t, because we're still in the process of checking all the details, but it should go through, is that for all these known integral polyhedra, we should have this density one uh, statement. So let me stop there. Thank you. instead of the actual curvatures. Okay. So the curvature is 1 over radius squared in four spheres. For circles, we can call them curvatures or bends. It doesn't yeah. make a difference. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. Yeah. not outside of plane. Yeah. So in higher dimensions, the curvatures proportional to 1 over r squared. Yeah. So, so but we want 1 over r because that's where the action of the group is. So there's an uh, I haven't said anything about actually the tools going into any of this. But what's really going on is there's a universal form which is measuring, so if you have two spheres, and I'm thinking of them as in Rn, and Rn is the boundary of Hn plus 1, so you should really think of these spheres as hemispheres, and then you can measure the um, cosh of the hyperbolic distance between the two of them, and that will be in terms of 1 over the radius. So it acts, so all of these groups act linearly on 1 over the radius. That's why that's the natural okay. thing to look at. Does that? Let it, let it down. Yeah. yeah. So in, in, in uh, proving things in higher dimensions, if everything is done from the root theoretic point of view. You don't have sort of elementary Descartes types of formulas that you could use to find relations between the bends. That's right. So uh, I haven't said where the Descartes formula, what the Descartes formula is. So when you have one of these clusters, and it's, it's the same for circle packings or sphere packings. If you have these clusters of uh, circles and spheres, you can make a Gramian of all their distances. And the Gramian will look like, um, so there's the cluster itself, and then there's the dual cluster. And we can measure the inner products of the clusters 
with, with its own circles, so the diagonal will always be in our, so the diagonal is the self-intersection, and the uh, convention is that the inner product of a sphere with itself is minus one, and if the sphere is a tangent, then the inner product is one. So you get this gram matrix, and a piece of the gram matrix of pi against pi, um, the inverse of that is Descartes' formula. So that's, so we can explain exactly what Descartes' formula is. In the case of the Apollonian packing, which I've drawn here, everything is completely mutually tangent. So uh, this, this matrix is self-dual, and one entry of this is self-inverse, and one entry is, uh, I think, the 2-2 two, two entry somewhere in some normalization, is Descartes' theorem. So it's just one piece of, it just comes from looking at the gram. So that's what Descartes' theorem is for all of these. And that's how you, you were asking about how you verify the integrality is once you've computed the Gramian, you compute the inverse Gramian, and after some change of variables, you can just see that the matrices acting on the curvatures in the full cluster are integers. And what happens in the um, hexagonal bipyramid and the hexagonal prism is that you'll get a matrix which is almost, uh, all the, there's, there's uh, 20 matrices or something, they're almost all integers except one, which has like a one-third in it. And that one third, you can see that the configuration has all, uh, there's, there's a, that one third is canceled out by a three somewhere. So the group is discrete. But when you fill it out to a super packing, the, those denominators start accumulating. And so it's not arithmetic. But it sits inside, this is one of these delete Mostow examples that I was explaining to Dennis. It's in, if you took the packing as a real group, so if you took, if you took this group as sitting inside the corresponding real group across the, the chaotic group. Now it would be discrete, but it's not a lattice in the product because it's a lattice already in the first factor. So that's how you construct non, that's one way of constructing non arithmetic groups. Another question? Um, what, what kind of machine was Sodi trying to build? Oh, he even has a picture. Uh, in his in his nature, I wish I had, I had thought to um, put it there. He, not only did he think to build it, he physically built it and took a picture of it. And it's a machine that looks kind of like this, and it has these spheres, got these goblets of spheres, but they all fall out if you just put them there. So there's these pins holding them in place. It's kind of amazing. Does it still um, exist? The picture or the no, machine? No, the machine. No. Yeah. I I have no idea where, you know. But he said he was, he was literally building this thing and he, he had to compute the curvatures, so he computed them and made this observation. And that's what Leibniz never built that thing. Is this some kind of linkage? To, what, what is it for? I don't even know. I think it's supposed to somehow be very easy to move things around. You, drop, you only need a little bit of oil for it to work because it's just tangent. So you don't need that much, you know, there's very little friction because the spheres are all just tangent, and they just sit with gravity. But no, I have no idea what he was doing. I don't remember it. He just said he had, it's the design of some actual mechanism. <clears throat> That's interesting, because Saadi criticized Hardy's mathematician's apology as cloistral clowning. Yeah. Any cool. other questions? Before we thank Alex for his very beautiful talk, uh, can I have a show of hands for people who intend to come to dinner, please? I'll raise it for Dennis. Two, three, four, five, six. Thank you.